you. I, I think Noah has given a twitch to any number of people. That's why we all say Noah. And none of us even try to say National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration anymore. Well, I am delighted to be here. Uh, I've been in and out of Pensacola a number of years, a number of times, but all of that is now a number of years ago in my NASA days when we would bounce through NAS Pensacola en route to various places or, or en route in and out of the exchange or en route in and out of uniform shops. And in fact, I was pleased to uh, meet in the audience tonight the gentleman who first tailored me up my very first set of navy dress blues uh, 200 years ago when I was a good bit younger and a whole lot skinnier. Uh, but it's uh, quite a delight to be back. Uh, what I would like to do tonight uh, is a departure from the normal astronaut, you know, show and tell zero G is wonderful, uh, though all of that is true and questions around any of that will be fair game when we're done. Uh, but we're watching interesting things and hearing interesting things in the news uh, these days, these last few years, about spaceflight and spacefaring. Uh, and so I put a talk together to pull some of those threads into one place and shed some light on them, at least from one astronaut's point of view. So my goal here would be for those who may not be familiar with it to do a very quick thumbnail sketch recap of uh, what some of the key events and constellations of players and driving forces of the early space days were. A uh, little bit of how we came up to the geometry uh, and population among nations we have now. And then shift and, and look at the question on the top here, Quo Vadis, where is it all going? I do not have a crystal ball. I am not giving magic answers. Uh, but we'll certainly put a lens down on what are different nations and entities saying today? What are they doing, trying to do, succeeding or failing to do today? And as we all watch this unfold through the media and the world around us in the several years and maybe decades ahead, uh, what might be some key questions to keep in mind and to be looking for insights about or answers to as technology evolves, as business parameters change, as national policy changes. So that's what I would like to uh, share with you today, um, sort of the who, what, where, when, and why. So the thumbnail sketch, uh, those of you my age and older, this will be a review. It's left as a review for the student. Those of you my height and, and shorter, it will probably not be a review. Uh, I don't want to hear where you are on the age curve. I don't like to be reminded of those things. <laughs> but um, the headline, if you will, for spacefaring in the 50s and 60s was really this one, the strategic competition between the USA and the USSR. Let's remember Sputnik was launched October 4th, 1957. It's sometimes very good now with the distance of time to remind ourselves what that moment really was in the broad span of time. 1957, 1957, think about that. That was not many years after the end of uh, World War II. Not many years after the end of World War II. No human being on the planet had ever put an object into orbit around the Earth ever at all. Big, long, lobbing ballistic arcs of long-range artillery shells or arguably the, the V1, V2, that was it. That's all anybody had done. So it's five years before Yuri Gagarin. It's 10 years before, uh, before a weather satellite. It's a huge moment that sits between a war and what we know now. The motivation for both the United States and the USSR really were these three things, to provide a public showcase, a very visible, open public showcase for look how good I am. Both nations had extremely large and aggressive military space efforts underway, deeply classified in both nations. And so this was also one way to basically say, if this is how good I am, I will do this stuff on television in the public eye sort of for grins, you might want to really worry about how fabulously capable I am with the important stuff. Don't mess with me. A big don't mess with me signal. Take me seriously. To their own populations, and you have to go back and really read the texture of commentary and news reporting at the time. Uh, so close to the end of one war, huge weaponry involved, great distrust between the nations. How do I show my own population? You can count on your nation. You can count on your nation's ability to protect you. You can count on the national capability to secure our borders. How do I show them that without showing them the military capabilities that I don't want the adversaries to know about? So pride and confidence to the population is a very strong thread that runs through all of the literature and official and rep reportorial commentary of both countries. And not to be uh, uh, underestimated at all, uh, 
there were only two nations out on the pointy end of this spear from a technology point of view. Every capability that derived from spaceflight was remarkable and revolutionary compared to the other technologies available broadly on the planet. Uh, imaging would be one. Communications, you know, global communications instantaneously. So it was a strong incentive, and it was very consciously used as a foreign policy objective to try to draw a circle of allies around you. Uh, as, as late as the late 80s and early mid-90s, uh, it was still an important part of military alliance policy in the United States, and selective decisions were made on a nation-by-nation -nation basis uh, with which of my current allies or would-be allies will I share what forms of high-capability data, you know, some high-resolution imaging data now. Much of that has changed. We'll touch on that uh, as we go forward here. But at that time, there were only two players that had these kind of capabilities. And aligning with them and committing friendship and support to them was the only way any other country got it. Uh, this stuff is now so widely disseminated, it's hard for us to remember how badly disseminated and localized it was back then and how important a, suasion, a force persuasion it was as a result. And of course, all of this impetus all of this effort, both in terms of the, the human intellectual capital and the scale of production and the abundance of production means was all a direct continuity of the World War II uh, scientific mobilization that led to things like the development of sonar and radar and the, the tracking and surveillance and reconnaissance techniques that now again are, again now are commonplace but were very cutting edge. All of that was continuity of effort, continuity of intellect, continuity of employment, of some of the world's best scientists in the service of the national security of their nations. That set of uh, forcing functions slowly began to ebb through this little bit in the 70s with the moments of detente and the gestures uh, on many levels and many fronts to try to keep the, the two major nations, superpower nations, sort of harmonious together. It really began to shift gears, of course, in the latter part of the 1980s as the uh, geometry of power in the Soviet Union uh, shifted so dramatically. Uh, the economics shifted or were revealed, maybe the more correct way to say it, uh, and all of the, uh, all the forcing functions that drove this uh, twin competition really abated. But concomitant with that uh, waning of the superpower battle, other new geometries and players were emerging. And a number of nations and constellations of nations began to focus on these technologies and on both how they could uh, benefit their national security capability and how they could feed and support civil and economic development. So in France, early on, uh, uh, and around the early 80s, they formed the Centre National des Etudes d'Espace, the, basically the French NASA, CNES, uh, and banded together uh, in an effort principally led by Germany, France, and Britain into the European Space Agency, now a collection of about 19 different countries, ranging from smaller players like Norway, who's principally a, an upper altitude space sciences country, to the major manufacturing and design nations of Britain and Germany, and even Spain. Uh, Europe formed its own astronaut corps in 1983. That was aligned with a joint initiative with the United States uh, around the space shuttle and the soon-to-be-launched Space Lab, and represented a very conscious commitment on Europe's part to not just be able to get instruments in and out of space, but to begin to develop a, an indigenous human knowledge base about the spaceflight experience, in, including the ambassadorial role of astronauts who can come and train, and entrain public opinion and sway the public view. Canada, in very similar fashion, uh, Canada, of course, uh, had been a significant aerospace player in the AV uh, aviation sphere back to the late 40s and mid 40s, uh, but began moving into the space arena fairly seriously in the late 70s and early 80s, again somewhat persuaded by the opportunity to join with the United States and Europe in the space station. Uh, they uh, established an astronaut corps. The dates here are the dates of the first flight of a, of a member of that cadre, not the date that the astronaut corps was formed. So. Uh, uh, Marc Garneau, in fact, flew along with me on my first flight in October 1984, uh, and they've been flying uh, astronauts periodically since. Canada has made a concerted effort to really unify uh, as the politics of the United States shifted and allowed this. Many members of the Canadian Astronaut Corps now don't stay in Canada working on science payloads, hoping to fly as a specialist with that payload. They actually are rotated down to NASA and work integral to the U.S. Astronaut Corps as full-spectrum members of space shuttle and space station crews. And Japan, uh, again, principally with a focus on, um, 
on astrophysics and deep space sciences formed JAXA uh, again around the late 70s, early 80s. So many more entrants. Uh, not all of these are, are uh, efforts to originate new technology or even to gain an indigenous design capability, but they're certainly efforts to stand up and join the ranks of nations who have some competency in spacefaring and in the technologies uh, that are developed to do that, but also that flow from that. If you look at a little color simple matrix to get a picture of so the who's who today, uh, very cartoonish and entirely interpretive on my part, so uh, <laughs> I put people where it seemed to me they belong. Um, so this is you know a launch capacity. Do you have the ability to launch a payload to orbit? Kind of any orbit. If you can get to low Earth orbit, you can probably manage getting beyond low Earth orbit. But achieving Building and designing a booster that can achieve low Earth orbit is not a trivial thing. Uh, have, do you have, have citizens of your nation flown? Do you have a satellite-based global navigation capability? Anything in the communications and broadcast relay vein? Earth applications, which is a huge, broad array. But I mean it here to principally be the, the natural resource, natural hazard, you know, from weather to earthquakes and agriculture, and planetary, uh, planetary probes and space astronomy. Green means a nation, denotes a nation that has developed some indigenous capacity for originating designs. Not just buying hardware, not just sending things on someone else's booster, but you've built one. You need a commsat, you have some ability within your nation to do that. And the important thing here, one of the key things here, is it is still true, 60 some years into the space age, it is still true that only three nations uh, this, is your, this is principally France, actually. It's Ariane Espace that I'm referring to here. But only three nations really have any self-developed indigenous launch capacity. Uh, Japan has a launch capability. It's a derivative of the United States Delta boosters. I put a sort of dark pattern there. They do have uh, an H5 vehicle that is a, a step beyond the Delta license. Uh, it's had a rocky start. It's not really a stable, proven vehicle yet, but it's getting there. So that box probably within a few years, they'll have enough success that you could legitimately color that green. India has a launch capability, but it's all Russian licensed boosters. China, the same thing. They even have a manned launch capability, but it's basically purchased material. They've had to muster the skill within their own workforce to operate it, but they have not had to develop the intellectual capacity to originate a design. So it's not a trivial accomplishment, what they're doing, but there's a big hurdle to get to the next step. Um, manned ops, a similar symbology. Uh, citizens from many of these nations have flown in space, but with the exception of riding on either a shuttle or uh, a Soyuz, uh, they've bought tickets on another nation's vehicle. Uh, China, I colored a little differently. Uh, it's not really yet a, legi a legitimate indigenous launch capacity. It's the Soyuz and uh, Proton boosters that now are the long march comes out of the Soviet ICBM fleet. They have put people into space, but again, it's a direct derivative of the Soyuz capsule and the Russian booster. Their 2000, year 2000 official Chinese white paper uh, announces very comprehensive plans to become indigenously proficient in all of these arenas over the next 20 years. India has announced plans uh, for a mission to the moon of an indigenous design. We'll come back to that in a bit. So a lot of capacity building, but still the point I'd like you to take away from here is the real core intellectual and technical capabilities of designing a system that actually can lift payload off this planet into orbit remains a very restricted accomplishment of only two nations. It's a key punchline. So why does anybody do this? I mean, you know, the war is over. We got to the moon. We can wear the been to the moon, got the t-shirt, you know. What is the deal and, and why space? I mean, why don't we do, why not a big push on, pick your favorite topic, pick your favorite domain. Why not the oceans? The oceans were on a similar plane for exploration in the 60s and fell by the wayside. Why not the human body? I mean, why? What is this thing, what is it about space that has drawn so much attention by so many nations and seems to keep doing so? Uh, sovereignty and autonomy are big ones. You read today's literature, and again, official proclamations, popular press, you name it, from China or India, and you would be struck by how totally parallel in content and rationale their sense of why are we doing this, how totally parallel it is to what those of us old enough to remember this 
would remember from the 40s and the 50s, the original impetus for the United States uh, in the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo program. It is about sovereignty. It is about autonomy on key technologies. It is about showing other nations that you are no longer a backward country. You are also no longer a country they dare disrespect. So that's very, very powerful. It adds a prestige and a gravitas. I am in the, I am in the family of developed nations. I deserve your respect economically and politically. Once I have demonstrated orbital capability, consistent orbital capability, there's a very critical military, military uh, consequence to that. It de facto means that no matter where you are on this planet, and no, and no matter how far away I am physically in terms of my sovereign territory, I can drop something on your head within 40 minutes. Small, no small deal. Uh, the Apollo effect also is something that you will read and you will hear very explicitly countered, uh, counted upon and uh, studied in all of the rhetoric of these countries. F folks, let me just tell you, all these other nations basically went to school on the United States and the Soviet Union. They watched the initiatives, they watched the effort, they watched and observed the leavening effect on education, on inspiration, on aspiration. They observed the cascade of benefits, technological and otherwise, that flowed from this silly looking effort to go to the moon, flowed through the entire society and economy, and they took notes. And they want that kind of a boost and that kind of economic and social improvement for their nations. So again, you'll see them in their literature uh, and their um, pronouncements coming back over and over again to the impetus this gives to research and technology and education across a very broad array of disciplines. And that, to me, is one of the hallmark distinctions of a, gr a grand initiative. Why take a grand challenge in space? Why not point in some other direction? Because it, it drives, it requires a drive on so many technologies across so many disciplines to such a high degree of precision and performance. It is, in many ways, the single scientific or technical challenge flag that's ever been raised that so comprehensively catalyzes this kind of development. So you see research technology education, very explicit focus on the development of uh, workforce and skills development. China has got 300,000 people, by recent estimates, working on their space program right now. They are deliberately over-employing in the space program because, again, of the catalytic and leavening effect on knowledge and technical skills. And the economic benefits. Just a couple of data points to put the scale of US space expenditures into perhaps a different perspective than you maybe have seen it before. Uh, NASA today, at its 16 billion and some, 16 billion and change budget, it's a big number. I don't have that many zeros in any of my budgets, so that's large. But if you put it into perspective of the percentage of federal outlays that it represents, NASA's full total budget, all expense functions, consumes about 86% of one penny of a federal dollar being expended. So it is still a big number. There may be many bases yet on which to debate the pros and cons of that national expenditure, but surely, surely it is not a valid line of argument to presume that 86% of a penny is some you know, wildly disproportionate share of federal investment for the wealthiest, most technologically advanced nation on the planet, especially when this point is true, the cascade of economic and other benefits into the economy. I know of only one study. Uh, it was done years ago by Chase Econometrics to assess the, um, the impact of the Apollo program. Uh, and their calculation was that for every dollar spent on the, in the Apollo program, Broadly, in all, all impacts, all in, the US economy gained $7 worth of benefit. Now, I'm a geologist. These guys are economists. I'm, I routinely assume economists are wrong uh, by often some sizable amount. So you know, let's just arbitrarily say that they're wrong by a factor of, heck, you could say they're wrong by a factor of 100, and they'd still be looking at a 7% return on the dollars invested in Apollo. That's not, not too shabby for kind of any rate of return outside of the 1990s, certainly not shabby in terms of a federal investment. So these things all combined remain the motives 
that are driving many of the nations that are entering or expanding their presence in the space arena. The summary headline would be that one. It is seen, it is recognized, there is confidence in it as a powerful catalyst to industrial development and innovation. So some of the questions to think about as you, we watch events unfold in the years ahead. Uh, this is a pivotal one. What actually will China accomplish? This very comprehensive plan, six years old now, it had a 10 year and a 20 year horizon. Uh, it sets out intentions for sovereign autonomy in all of those key functions I showed you, global navigation, communication, broadcast, manned flight. It is explicit about intentions to develop a low earth orbiting space station. It is explicit about intentions to go to the moon. Their pronouncements about going to the moon are sort of amusing and, and maybe uh, illustrative or informative in another way. They, they fairly drip with derision for the foolishness that the United States showed uh, years ago of building a capacity to get to the moon, you know, running the race, getting there, and sort of doing the, you know, been there, done that, I have the t-shirt, and then surrendering all of that capacity. And there's almost a sneering tone to some of the Chinese pronouncements about not being so foolish as others were to run up and sort of touch the base and come back, but actually to stay and advance and move society forward. They're very ambitious. It's a very comprehensive set of plans. To accomplish them certainly will require significant change uh, in the caliber and the, the demographic depth of skills development within their population. Uh, and it will certainly require some considerable degree of political and economic stability for a sustained period of time. That's another dimension that is clearly fairly conscious in the uh, leadership intentions of China as they announce this. I'm sure there are people in this room that know China's history better than I do, but it is one that is laced with episodes of north-south urban-rural tensions that divide along opportunity and economic advantage. You can see some of that happening now uh, within China. So this is not any kind of a slam dunk and it's probably the real zinger question on whether China will be able to move forward towards these goals. How about Europe? Uh, Europe has announced, uh, it has a, a current and active strategic roadmap, as they call it. Uh, this would be the third of their, uh, they do five year, every five years they do a new strategic roadmap that looks 10 to 15 years out. So they just you know, re-up the front end of it every five years or so. They have actually quite a good track record if you look retrospectively at the first two cycles of the space strategic roadmap of accomplishing the things that they have set out. That's not a small challenge for the European Union or the European Space Agency. It's a, it's a cumbersome pluralistic mechanism. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to move it along and keep everybody coherent, but they've done that. This uh, current strategic roadmap has a component named Aurora that is basically planetary and astronomical space exploration, space sciences, if you will, in a fairly fundamental sense. It has a very large component that is uh, titled this, Global Monitoring for the Environment and Security. This is really putting a very new marker down about Europe's intentions, not only to be able to supply the data needs of their own member nations, but to really be a standout player on monitoring the global environment uh, uh, and providing the kind of operational observing system that more and more is needed for everything from crop and agricultural planning to natural disaster uh, forecasting and, and consequence mitigation. They really plan to step up and step out on that. And security in, in a combination of senses, the national security intelligence sense to that word in this initiative and also a sustainability of society, sustainable economic development, sort of a political stability centered around natural resources. Both of those meanings are clear. One that I find very, a dimension I find very intriguing to read in their roadmap is this one, this final one, technologies for competitiveness. Uh, again, just signals how clearly and consciously this roadmap, this space roadmap marks in Europe's mind the moment where they may actually have the ability to step out in front of the United States and even the Soviet Union and become a reigning leader in the designer and the developer and the provider to the marketplace of these technologies. They intend to be an economic competitor. They intend to have enjoy some of the economic success that comes with that. So very much a technologies to market focus. And what about us on this side of the pond? Um, Internationally, our partners uh, on the space frontier, I'm, I'm confining my remarks here totally to space relations, uh, they are very skeptical of American reliability. Uh, 
Ken Ford just heard this a while back in some meetings he's had in Europe. You hear it almost everywhere you go in the science or technology sphere. Uh, the view is that, that we are so wrapped up in the vicious, insidious in insider game of US domestic politics that nothing we say as a nation actually really matters. We can make a commitment to another nation. We can make a commitment to a consortium of nations. We have no ability from administration to administration to actually commit the nation. I can commit my guys while I'm in office. You're on your own once I leave. Uh, it's been seen before uh, a couple of times where we've conceived of a grand new space sciences mission. The International Solar Heliospheric Observer would be one. Big new spacecraft, fabulous science, germane to everybody living on Earth invited, sort of urged and cajoled Europe into the fray, in no small part to uh, secure a cost-sharing discount advantage for our own budgetary pressures. Got them all committed to where they had spent you know, nine-digit numbers on their contributions, and then said, mm, actually, no, we don't think so, and walked. So leave them in the lurch. That is what it is felt is what certainly many uh, folks within Europe feel we're doing to them again on space station. Europe, and the estimates I have seen, is reckoned to have spent $300 million on preparation of its components for the International Space Station under all multilateral negotiated agreements signed at head of state level. One of their components is in orbit. All the rest are built of sunk costs already spent on the ground. And we show up one day and say, you know, actually, we're not flying this airplane after 2010. And so the story of the last two years has been massaging the shuttle manifest to try to fit enough launches in to do reasonable justice by commitments that go back 22 years. Uh, one of my first high-level PR assignments for NASA was actually being ferried up to the White House 10 days before my first space flight. No one on the planet can violate the L minus 30 training time frame of a US astronaut, except the United States president. And uh, <laughs> so we were summoned, my crew commander and I, and the Canadian Mark Garneau, who was going to fly with us, we were all summoned to Washington 10 days before liftoff, yanked out of the simulators at 11 at night, plopped in an airplane, flown up to DC, a few hours of sleep. And our role was to you know, be the, the uh, elegant and respected spacefarers standing in the background as, as uh, President Reagan and Prime Minister Mulroney shook hands over the deal that would bring Canada into the space station fold. So that was October 1984. So these are 22-year agreements that partners now feel like we've just gotten sort of bored and decided not to do anymore. Uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't make us, uh, it leaves us out of a number of things. At the same time, the space shuttle replacement remains highly uncertain. We have a fixed retirement date that we're being sounding very, very certain about. We don't have an, even have a clear design commitment. We don't even have a clear timeline that provides any kind of meaningful design iteration or design trade-off flight or prototype study. We, we scarcely have a timeline that provides a decent window of, of high-resolution simulation. So we're very much at risk of doing a quick grab of a first thing that sort of sounds good because we've got to make a timeline and discovering all the warts and blemishes of a complex design as we build and live a complex design. Uh, this is an aviation town. The museum out at the air base and countless other uh, sources around here remind many folks in this audience as well as me, that's a really dumb way to do airplanes. That's just never been the way an airplane that has served its purpose well has ever come about. Uh, so that's another issue. There are growing domestic concerns among national leadership both houses on the Hill, the White House, uh, media figures, industrial leaders, you name it, uh, growing domestic concerns about education, the quality of education, especially with respect to science, math, and technology in the United States at all grade levels. It is both the general concern about the general technical competency of our population and a concern about feeding the pipeline of ad advanced skilled workers that can be the next designers, the next researchers. So it's a twin concern. It's not just PhDs and masters. It's, it's will our whole population be literate enough to repopulate our own workforce? The data and the trends are sobering and worrisome in that regard. Uh, so this is a huge concern that's really gotten a lot of press and a lot of uh, impetus behind it just in the last year, year and a half, with one critical exception, not among American parents. Public Agenda put out a, one of its reality check studies earlier this year, 
surveying attitudes among American parents. And at something like the 60, 60 plus percent level, American parents feel quite satisfied with the science and math education their students are getting and are quite confident that they will be well prepared for the world. And American students at about a 45% level self-report that they would be actually very unhappy if they found themselves in a job that required any significant amount of science or math. This at a time when 15% of all jobs in our workforce, all jobs, are reported to require basically a bachelor's level competency or knowledge base in science and math. So expectations are soft. Uh, Worry is low. Achievement is low and declining. Our best performing math students in the United States uh, now rank well down at the bottom of OECD developing nations. Our best performers in the United States tie in measured mathematics performance with that renowned technological powerhouse, Latvia, <laughs> our top performers. So this dichotomy of actual performance of leadership and employer concerns versus parental attitudes is something that should deeply worry all of us. We have a pluralistic local-based school and schooling system. The outcome and performance of our schools will not change until the key input of community and parental expectation changes. All right, but none of that is going to matter because tourism is here. <laughs> I mean, space tourism is like right around the corner, and it's just going to be fine. Well, this is what space tourism looks like today. This is a, a proton booster taking off from Baikonur, a space adventures client uh, on board. And here's the Soyuz capsule on approach to the International Space Station. Uh, and here is one of those clients, Greg Olson, uh, drifting around inside the base block module of the space station. Uh, my uh, astronaut colleagues who've had some of these clients aboard tell me that there's one um, one inaccuracy in this picture, in the normal state of affairs, there would be Greg Olson with one each astronaut who knows what they're doing on each arm, you know, <laughs> flying him through the module and making sure he doesn't make any mistakes or even try to touch something. <laughs> and there are grand plans uh, being floated by many, many parties for uh, even more elaborate scale and variety of space tourism activities in the future. This is an artist concept of a public spaceport that Space Adventures uh, is dreaming of building in uh, Singapore. They have another very fancy design for a spaceport in Dubai. Uh, and of course, some recent announcements in New Mexico that we'll come to in a moment. Uh, then there's uh, Bob Bigelow. Bob B Bigelow made his fortune uh, creating and running the Budget Suites hotel chain, a Las Vegas born and bred American entrepreneur. Uh, and he's now committed to plowing $500 million, half a billion dollars, over 15 years into developing these inflatable, habitable modules that could become a hotel in orbit. Suppose, looking at uh, the price tags you hear bandied about are you know, a million bucks a night. Who knows? Uh, and as I came in this evening, in fact, uh, someone in the audience uh, provided me a page from Forbes.com uh, from just a couple of days ago, May, May 19th. And I'll just read you a couple of key points here because this is much, much in the news. This, is at the, um, this was at the Future in Review conference out in Coronado, California just a week and a half ago. How about space travel? Elon Musk, co-founder of PayPal, current chief executive of rocket company SpaceX, and Chris Farinetta, vice president of orbital space flights for Space Adventures, held a roundtable discussion that veered from the serious, NASA's dire straits, to the silly, traveling through wormholes. Musk is targeting a manned mission to Mars before the decade is out, the next decade is out. He's got the details worked out too, it says here, all the way to a prototype capsule on his company's manufacturing floor. It would be a six month trip one way with a one and a half year stay followed by a six month return trip. Current cost estimates are out of reach, about five billion a person. But, but you'll be <coughs> pleased to know, Musk is working to bring that down. <laughs> and it, and it, it goes on. I, I have to read just one other great bit here. Most surprising, fuel costs aren't a problem. <laughs> Musk's rockets run on a combination of refined jet fuel that costs $1.90 a gallon and liquid oxygen that costs 30 cents a gallon. Between now and Mars, Musk's company has 10 contracts for satellite launches worth $200 million. He says he'll be cash flow positive this year. 
and he has a tip for NASA. Raise cash by selling lunar rocks off to major jewelry houses. Quote, it doesn't get more precious than that, unquote, Musk says. Now, just a couple of observations about the, uh, the excitement in, in this news release. My first observation just has to be, so far, what Elon Musk has accomplished in his rocketry is blowing up rockets. Okay, if it really was this easy, really everybody would be doing it. Uh, rocket flight requires that thousands of people working all the technical dimensions of a very long and complex chain all have their calculation and their manufacturing precisely right. And it is the nuances of the interactions between systems that more times than not is what trips you up. They look like firecrackers, they're not firecrackers. It is harder than that. So, but here are a few other small problems. So how much demand is there actually out there? I mean, what can space tourism become? Current technologies, even the technology that Musk is looking at working with here, conventional chemical rocketry, no matter which fuel mix you're putting in it, at the performance levels that humankind knows how to do, it is $10,000 per pound in round numbers to lift anything off the Earth to low Earth orbit. A gallon of water weighs six pounds. $60,000 to lift a gallon of water off the Earth to provide drinking. That's why you make water on orbit with fuel cells, if at all possible. So that, you know, that's the benchmark figure you want to keep in your mind. And as you watch and hear the entrepreneurs, Jeff Bezos of Amazon is involved. A lot of these guys backing these efforts are serial entrepreneurs putting huge amounts of private money into the game, which I think is absolutely fabulous. But they're putting it into the front end of assembling new integrated systems of today's components to drive this traffic. So this is a key question. At $200,000 for Sir Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic, what I call the pole vault flight, if he launches you up and over a big pole vault and you clear 100 kilometers at the top, you can legitimately say you've been in space. That satisfies the international definition. You will have gone about Mach 3, three times the speed of sound. For reference, going all the way to orbit is Mach 25. So it's eight times faster. And the energy you have to manage on propulsion going up and heating coming down you know, scales uh, exponentially with that. So it's a, it's a not trivial accomplishment, but it is a very small step compared to being in orbit. 200,000 is the number that's being bandied about for the 20 minute seats on Spaceship Two when that gets built. 20 million is what Space Adventures charges today for one of the seats they have optioned on the Soyuz vehicle. Now, my understanding from what bits I've been able to see of some of their business plans is the reckoning is that there are 20 million millionaires on the planet and then you just start doing market penetration math. You know, I'll get 5% of 20 million millionaires to pay one of these tickets, run the numbers, you know, X times Y equals big, big bunches of money. Okay, so here's the next question. I'll grant, I'll grant you 5%. I'll grant you 5% of 20 million. You got a million guys out there. That's, you know, that's okay. Will that cash flow actually drive new technologies? What mixture of profit versus reinvestment and I don't mean reinvestment and build another rocket for 10 more tourists to go. I mean reinvestment in the kind of fundamental research that could change $10,000 a pound into $5,000 a pound, or maybe $1,000 a pound. We've all lived in our era, in our lifetimes, the, the sort of transformations that happen when some key new technology slides down that price curve. You know, when your handheld calculator could add, subtract, divide, multiply, and do a square root and cost $500 to where you can get one credit card size that does all of that and more for $9.95 at Staples. And the ways and the places, the applications that we now apply those things to expand fabulously when those price curves move. But the kind of research it takes to change those price curves uh, is not new rocket system integration. It is fairly fundamental research into materials, into technologies, into chemistry, uh, pretty basic stuff that typically has a 10 to 20 year horizon before you get some actionable result out of it. You have to markedly improve safety, reliability, and cost to really change this equation. So my punchline question, this is my code phrase for for this one, I can readily accept that space tourism will become a viable business for some number of market entrants. 
more like Everest. I mean, you can buy a ticket to Everest today, 65,000 bucks, and probably two years of a gym membership if you're smart, because you actually do have, they don't like to have the Sherpas carry you up the mountain. You're supposed to walk. <laughs> they will carry you up the mountain. More importantly, they will carry you off the mountain. So, you know, Everest is 65,000 bucks a pop. A dive in a three-man submersible to Titanic is 35,000 bucks a pop. Uh, you know, a trip to the Antarctic is between eight and $20,000 a pop. There's, so there is tourism to all three of those places. It is not high volume. It is not large participation. None of it is of that sort of anything that's going to fundamentally change the technologies of getting to those places or surviving in those places <laughs> or in any way uh, dealing with the environments that you're in. But you can go and you can sample it and you can come back fabulous slides. You can dine on that at the country club for a long time. But what would it take? What's, is there a missing ingredient that we can spot or get our, our heads around that would transform the, you know, the Everest model or the Titanic model into something more like a Southwest Airlines? What could be that demand multiplier that might expand that set? Uh, I think purpose, the, the purpose for which people want to do this uh, is the key one, and I don't think anyone has found a good driver to that yet. If you look at the early history of aviation, commercial aviation, in a very abbreviated nutshell version, uh, but I would trace some of the pivotal factors that turned you know, Charles Lindbergh, Barnstormers and Charles Lindbergh into Pan Am World Airways, there are a couple of really big factors that I don't see happening yet in the space arena. We had a war. We all paid for national security purposes, the fixed cost investment to dramatically expand the scale of production capacity we had for airplanes. We all paid to drive rapid new designs of robust airframes, robust power plants, highly maintainable, field maintainable, simple maintainable, and we needed a lot of them. We all paid to train the mechanics, the technicians, the pilots, the navigators to man that effort and win the war. And when the war ended, that surplus was sitting there waiting to be tapped and assembled into new combinations. Juan Trippi's fabulous innovative insight and passion was to reintegrate some of those resources around a new kind of aviation for everybody. And his first important economic step actually was to persuade the United States government that it should begin moving the United States post by air and that it should not do that through a federal airline should hire him. And through plain old good American politics, got himself a monopoly contract to carry mail. Well, we all love to communicate with each other, and the faster the better. So there's a volume of mail. So he, he now has, he made none of the fixed cost capitalization investments. He's got his direct costs covered for flying back and forth across the country. And now he can come up to any of you and say, I'm doing it anyway. I'm flying to California anyhow. Come on along and try it. You'll probably like it. So he didn't have to make the consumer case to us with his economics in the balance. He could invite, he could prime the pump of demand and interest by offering rides. So where is something like mail? Where is something like communications in the space arena? It has happened on the communications satellite front. What might it be on the humans going to space front? I think is the really core, deep question. Uh, and frankly, I don't yet hear any of the tourism guys really having a profound answer to that. I think several of them will succeed in a business sense themselves, but I don't see the transformation happening there. Just a couple other very much more recent news highlights. Just a couple of months ago, a brand new bilateral between ESA and the new Russian Space Agency touches on all of these uh, topical elements, the ones we've been talking about since we began. Uh, but I'd call your attention to the second to the last one. We have Russia and Europe directly in a two-way discussion about what are we going to do in space sciences and using the International Space Station. Because these guys said they're gone. And Russia are the only guys left that will have an ability to get people to and from the space station. And why, again, just one specific example. I've been alleging that all these nations cite the sort of factors I've been talking about. Here's a, an extract, extract from that document. A key role for economic and social development, considerable potential benefits for civil society. That remains the fundamental rationale. Some other moving pieces that are quite interesting and will bear significant and close watching. 
there's some indications that Japan, as they increase their spectrum and, uh, and the uh, ambitiousness of their activities in space, and also as they see the threats around them changing with China's emerging capability, uh, Japan is rumored to be re-evaluating whether it will retain its civilian uses only policy with respect to its space activities. That is a core policy, uh, a Japanese national policy that goes back to the decks of the USS Missouri and, and the uh, World War II armistice. But they're now beginning to look sort of pragmatically and say, yeah, this stuff that we're doing for remote sensing could be really helpful on a national security front. So that'll bear watching. Bob Bigelow, the guy who wants to put the hotel in orbit, obviously also needs someone who can get you to the hotel. So in a variant, a follow-on to the Ansari X Prize, he has announced America's Space Prize with a $50 million tag. The accomplishments that you have to do to get it are these. You have to get a spacecraft to 250 miles. It has to complete two full orbits. It has to demonstrate a capability to dock. Uh, with the adapter that he will use on his craft, and then you have to be able to repeat that flight accomplishment within 60 days, a fully all commercial enterprise. India, as I showed on my color chart, has uh, announced a plan for to, to build and launch a lunar probe, and in an interesting switch of affairs, the NASA administrator just within the last couple of weeks made a trip to India and committed to put a U.S. science payload on the Indian platform to the moon because it's frankly going to be a whole lot longer our, time, our announced timelines are much longer than their timeline for being able to get a payload back to the moon. It's also good bilateral uh, collaboration with India given the general state of affairs in Southwest Asia. There's a lunar landing analog competition that's been announced with a two and a half million dollar prize that ties into a, a festival of space called the X Cup. The prize is to lift off from the Earth hover at a, get to at least a certain altitude, translate or shift laterally a set amount of distance, be able to land again, which is broadly analogous to the set of tasks that you would face landing on and departing from the moon. And one of the places that they're proposing to host this competition is in the uh, New Mexico spaceport area that's just been announced. This is an artist concept of the kind of NASCAR of spaceflight that uh, these guys are envisioning. This is the X Prize guys moving on to new uh, ideas about how to foment this kind of competition and innovation. And they really see and hope they can create uh, in New Mexico out by Alamogordo, something like this would be all sorts of folks vying for all sorts of different prizes and hurdles and like an air, an air show with rockets. Um, and they really do, they use the language, the NASCAR uh, of space to try to get the public interest moving along. So this is try, probably trying to expand the set of 20 million millionaires who might be willing to save up their money and buy some of those tickets. So lots of very uh, you know, intriguing and amusing and ambitious and uh, very lofty, lofty visions. If you study the history of spaceflight, you do learn to never sneer at cartoons. I could show you a cartoon that was a painting that appeared, it was done in 1951 and it appeared in an issue of Collier's Magazine in 1952. The text of the article that it illustrated was describing Werner von Braun's visions for what, what might spacefaring be like 10 or 20 years from now. And you would recognize the artwork, any of you that have ever watched 2001, because the painting was done by Chesley Bonestell, who actually did some of the initial artwork uh, for Stanley Kubrick when he was putting 2001 together. So you see a space station on the right, hub and spoke, and this very odd looking winged craft that's described as a shuttle that just takes people back and forth to the station. And this weird thing in the middle that looks like someone pulled apart a Tylenol capsule, that's described as a telescope. So this painting done in 1951, now you're really right between World War II and Sputnik. You're six years from the end of the war and you're six years before Sputnik. And this painting, you know, just none of it's happened. No one's ever done any of this. And you might look at it, maybe you'd look at that painting and have the same reaction some of you did here. A little chuckle, a little laugh, you gotta be kidding me. It'll never happen, they couldn't do it. Why would they do it? Who would care? All of those things. But I met that Bonestell painting in 1985 when a guy I was working for on a presidential space study thought it would be a fabulous front piece for our report to have the original 1951 painting reproduced and below it, an update of that scene painted by Bob McCall, America's current reigning great space artist. And so I, saw, I walked into our conference room to look at the page layouts and saw these things side by side. I'd never seen the first painting. And those two paintings 
were the bookends of my life to that point in time. The first painting was painted the year I was born. No human being in the whole history of humankind, no human being had ever done any of those things, had never really even tried yet to build one of those things. And 33 years later, I'm looking at it side by side with a painting that shows the space shuttle I just flew in, the space station that's already being designed, the one I got yanked out of the simulator to go be a potted palm in the photo for. And the telescope has turned from a Tylenol capsule into the Hubble telescope, which I was already assigned to help deploy on my second flight, and had already been crawling all over out in California. So never sneer at artist concept, because artist concepts, many of them, become eventually the story of people's lives. So the question remains, Quo Vadis, where does it go? Where does spaceflight go? Where do we go? Uh, and my final message to you would be, obviously, none of, us, none of us can know the destination, and none of us can know all of the points, challenges, hurdles, uh, opportunities, and celebrations along the way. There's just one thing we can know. We can know what we are going to decide to do. We can know how we choose to approach that broad prospect, and whether we choose to stand up and reach for it and strive for it, or we choose to not do that. Uh, I've always loved this comment by Andre Gide, man cannot discover new oceans unless he has the courage to lose sight of the shore. There's still a great vast horizon out there on the sea of space, and we have only barely gotten out to about knee deep water. So it is my hope that we will stand and reach for it and strive for it, and on behalf of the younger folks in the audience, like Miss Blakely back there, that they can grow up having the same bold, dramatic prospect and pride and inspiration for what they can be, what their future might be, and how they might be able to contribute to shaping it that I certainly remember from the years between those two paintings. Thank you very much. Blakely has a question. Here comes the microphone. What planet did you go to? Ah, excellent. But, but it's a really, well, it's kind of a disappointing answer. The, the space shuttle doesn't have strong enough engines or big enough fuel tanks to get very far away from this planet. We can, all we can do in a space shuttle is go around and around this planet. Uh, and pretty nearby, a couple hundred miles away. So, you know, a tenth of a percent of the, hundredth of a percent of the way to the moon. So this is the only planet I have gotten to go to. It's a pretty good planet. I don't mind it at all. Uh, but I'd give, my, uh, I'd give my eye teeth to get to go to Mars. And so when you go there, you're going to have to take me with you, please. <laughs> Great question. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Sullivan, thank you so much for coming. My name is Betty Carden. I'm the Northwest Florida IEEE Women in Engineering Chairperson. And the question I have for you is research that I've been doing for quite a while. <clears throat> uh, with many touting that the National Science Foundation and President Bush compared apples to oranges regarding the indicator report, do you believe there is indeed an impending shortage of indigenous scientists and engineers, and if so, what do you think will move this nation toward resolving the problem? Thank you for that question. Um, I, I do think we have uh, an impending big set of problems with respect to our science and technology workforce. Uh, it is twofold to me. Uh, I think we, we will suffer badly and not be as competitive as we should want to be among nations if we don't have a, a better general level of science and technology, knowledge and competence broadly in all of our citizenry. We're not currently doing that. We're not currently delivering that and giving that to, to high school leaving students. So that's number one. Um, the predictions, various forecasts about you know, repopulating the professional pipeline and professional ranks are, are notoriously bad. Uh, 
uh, notorious error rate when you look retrospectively at them. I come at the professional pipeline question a little differently. I, I don't know what the answer is to how many we actually do need. Uh, I don't know what the answer is to how all of the globalization trends affect uh, what our nation needs, so, which is a very different question than what companies need to succeed. But what, what do we as a nation need in terms of technical capacity to sustain our communities, run our societies, you know, the, the functions that we need living here on this piece of dirt, how do we do that? I worry there uh, at least as much about the quality of the talents that we will have. Uh, I don't know how you get from a generally, clearly inadequate level of competency for most students leaving high school to somehow an acceptable level of competency for the um, skilled, trained, or advanced degree professionals that we need. So that, that worries me at least as much as the quantity in the pipeline. How do you get there from here? I could, I could stack reports as, as tall as this uh, podium, going back just without any trouble going back to 1983, <coughs> all of them by you know, august panels. Every panel is, had included a mixture of educators and business leaders and corporate folks and government folks. I mean, there's nothing wrong with any of the panels. There's nothing wrong with any of the charters or the terms of reference. There's a tremendous congruence in their findings. And the, the variance between them seems to be you know, another group of people coming up to the same sense of the same problem, knowing the last six guys failed to make any change or movement happen, and trying to find some new approach to a rallying cry or a line of advance or a little bit of a chink in the armor that would change the static equation. Um, I don't know a simple way to do that in this country. Uh, we are driven, we have a very grassroots pluralistic school system. There is a lot of strength and good to that. There are also some uh, less good side effects to it. Our curriculum across the United States tends to be you know, 200 miles wide and about an eighth of an inch deep. Uh, concepts do not build and reinforce over time. No one wants anybody to tell them which concepts. I, so it's, that's a problem. The biggest problem to me is if the primary drivers, the primary drivers of education in the United States of America are parents. Uh, we, parents and adults make the decisions about funding, they make the decisions about how engaged to be in supporting and guiding uh, their child's schooling. Uh, they basically are making the decisions about what is acceptable or not acceptable. Uh, if you repeated the public agenda opinion survey in other countries, it, and I've seen this done a couple years ago, the irony is that Countries whose scores are like this and improving, the parental attitudes are only more demanding. They're, they see the criticality of competency in these fields. It's imperative that their kids have it. It's impossible for the schools to do too much. It really has to be rigorous, and I would like to see more confidence that it's very, very rigorous. Our scores are like this, and the parental attitudes tend to be, oh, it looks so hard, and oh, so much homework, and oh, poor babies, oh, dear, oh, gosh, it's way harder than when I was there. And we have an immense complacency about this. Yes, sir, in the back. Well, actually, why don't we work our way back there? Brendan, we'll start with this gentleman. Coming to you. OK. Dr. Sullivan, my name is Jordan Britt. I am the uh, editor of uh, Ex Astra Scientia. It's a space online news journal. It's not so much a comment, not so much as a question, but a comment I have is that I've seen over the years a decline in public knowledge of space, just ba basic space exploration and, and what NASA does. And I see this happening as a failure on the part of the federal government and NASA in general that doesn't get the people involved. It's like you said, you know, the parents are taxpayers. You know, the parents are going to be responsible for NASA funding. But when the parents don't have a clue why their taxpaying dollars are being spent on ISS or shuttle or, or more, uh, more, uh, more, more recently, the Vision for Space Exploration, you don't see... Did you have a question in here? Yeah. Okay. okay. You don't, uh, where, is, uh, where is NASA and the government in creating a true debate about space activity in this country? Okay, it's, uh, it's an excellent question, and it's one that uh, I think tees up a, an important civics lesson for all of us to bring back to mind. Uh, executive branch agencies in the United States government can only do what the law allows them to do. Uh, and the Space Act, that, the Organic Act that established NASA, the Space Act does have some provisions in it that allow education 
but it is really meant in sort of a supporting science education vein. There, uh, the Congress, frankly, sees the dynamic a little differently than, than you're imagining it. The Congress are your representatives to, uh, to the federal government. They are the ones the president may propose anything. It is the Congress that takes those proposals, debates it, decides what to do. The Congress, frankly, doesn't much like executive branch agencies reaching around them through public information or marketing or other campaigns to try to autonomously sway public opinion, sort of breaks the civics dialogue. So federal agencies, in fact, cannot do what you are hoping you would see them do. Convene debates. Public interest societies can. The National Space Society can. The Planetary Society can. Universities can. Wait a minute. I remember how this goes. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. We can do that. Uh, the longer we sit back waiting for someone who ought to do it for me or to me to do it, we, that's the trap we're in. It is the role of citizens participating in their democracy to do those things. It is not the role, as our law describes it, it is not the role of federal agencies to mount marketing or even public communications campaigns. So if you want to know and understand something more about something that is or isn't happening uh, in our country, governmental or not, it is a user-pull equation. Stand up, reach out, start asking, find out. Don't sit back and lament why someone else hasn't done it for you sooner. There was a young lady over here somewhere. Could you describe the look of Mars? Oh, I wish I could. I have not ever been really any closer to Mars than you have been. So I spend a lot of time on the websites for the European Space Agency. The European Space Agency has a fabulous spacecraft orbiting Mars right now called Mars Odyssey that actually has taken the best postcard, I might even have it here, the best postcard ever yet taken of Earth was taken from Mars. All right, so the guy that said little blue marble, this is proof positive that he had it right. Uh, this is not, this is not an artist concept. This is a photograph, a photograph, a digital photograph of the Earth and of our moon taken from Mars. So it's taken from about 80, forget what the timing was and what the exact, let's say order of magnitude, 80 million miles away. This distance is 250,000 miles to first order. It's left, it's left as an exercise to the reader to determine where the sun is in this picture. <laughs> Okay, so if you were in charge of the space program, what would we do next? Well, I'd have to be in charge of a whole lot more than the space program to make it happen. But if, if you made me Tsarina for a while, <laughs> um, if you made me Tsarina for a while, I would, uh, mine would be uh, that we shall put humans on Mars uh, in a set, a set and aggressive period of time. Uh, and it would not, my motives would be, I mean, there will be some intrinsic uh, and I believe in the long run important to mankind knowledge about Mars, other planets, our solar system, and thereby our planet that would derive over time. But my primary motive would be the ones I talked about here. What, what that would do, if, if we came again to have confidence, she said it, she means it, she ain't blinking. You, know, you go tell her we're not going to get it done. I'm just going to go try to get it done. You know, that's what you need. I said it, I mean it, we're going to get it done. You would see a catalytic effect uh, on, on the youth of our country, on engineering, on education, and you would see we'd, we'd have to do like crazy to change the reliability, the safety figures. We'd have to solve a whole bunch of taking care of human being problems, communication problems, human interface problems. That is so out there of a driver on, on understanding how humans think, under the work of this center. What do we need to really understand? How do people think? How can they absorb so much information? How do we, you know, what's the best we can do and then get beyond that? And in the 30 years after you brought them home, you would see all of those technologies enter and pervade the economy in every avenue of our life. And we, we would have a, a fresh hopper full of seed corn in the, the national repository of knowledge and capability that would feed through companies and organizations and communities for decades afterwards. So that would be mine. Careful what you ask for if you put me in charge. One more question. Yeah. 
One more question. How would you direct uh, your uh, a policy towards education and especially accountability when uh, No Child Left Behind actually makes it punitive to teachers uh, if they are not uh, if they do not bring up the scores of the lower uh, uh, students because stu the teachers are held accountable because of uh, if they do not raise the scores of the lower percentile then uh, they are not accelerated. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, it, it, it is a difficult policy challenge to craft a balance between accountability for performance and the kind of intended and unintended uh, intended incentives and feedbacks that come along with that. Uh, you know, I, don't, I don't know anyone, I don't even know anyone serving in the administration that would claim that the language and the implementation of that act or or the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and you know, none of them has ever been perfect. Uh, we've got to keep working through problems that we create intentionally and unintentionally and fix them. I think, personally, I think the reality, one reality of No Child Left Behind that I think is very positive is, is, it, is a, it is a good thing that we finally start looking at where we're leaving the least performing of our students. It is a good thing that we look at that and that we set ourselves the challenge and goal of improving their educational lot in life and the path that they can have. Its current implementation is far from perfect. Uh, it, it is in some ways and it certainly feels to many people uh, uncomfortably punitive. Um, I don't have a simple answer for that. I mean, the, there, there's not been, there hasn't been any kind of signal of direct measurable accountability in, injected into some of that system for so long that the presence of any feedback loop uh, is, is going to be uncomfortable, at least in first application. So, you know, they're not push button answers to these things. It's, it's, it's keep, it's an answer we're having trouble with as a nation. It's called keep conversations going, not shouting matches, not wrestling matches. It's okay, it's a complex problem, it's got many stakeholders. You only ever make progress on those if you actually can bring a conversation, actually listening to each other, actually trying to understand what the other person said, actually thinking about it and knowing that you will be heard in turn. And our civic dialogue in uh, far too many cases is very lacking in those regards. So it compounds the problem that you're concerned about. Lane Space Center for the last 10 years. So the teachers are, are very excited that you're here. And I know with uh, Barbara Morgan getting ready to go back into space, there'll be a lot of buzz with that. It's an opportunity to get both teachers, parents, and students engaged in, in more space science. But here's my question to you as a teacher. I mean, there, there's some, there is something wrong when only one particular human being flying can generate the interest. I mean, Barbara is a delightful person. Uh, but, you know, we're there's something wrong in what we're doing to, with our kids that we have to wait until a certain correct celebrity level person goes to generate some interest. Humankind is flying in space every single day. Human beings visit the bottom of the ocean of this planet every single day. Humans are exploring cognition and micro every single day. So somehow it, it can't just be, it can't just be that life is only interesting if you're LeBron James or Barbara Moore. I mean, it just can't be that that's true. And somehow we have to try to. And, and teachers that are passionate about it, like the teachers that are with me, are the ones who are going to make that difference in the classroom. You know, and there's a lot of things that they've been working on the last 10 years to try to incorporate that, those space technologies and science and math into regular everyday curriculum. But what advice do you have for the teachers then to bring that passion to their students and to the parents? Um, you know, it's, there, there's not a magic answer. It's, it's, it's show the passion, uh, it's express it, it's, uh, it's create, create the opportunities that, that are hands-on learning, that do engage the students. There's, there's an abundance of research out there that shows inquiry-based and constructivist approaches are very powerful and very compelling uh, at, at all sorts of grade levels, including when imposed on major, majors level courses in the sciences at university. So, um, it's, it's stay in the fray. It's, you know, you make this change kind of one at a time from the inside out and there's no shortcut way to do it. So all of you who are uh, involved in school systems, working on curriculum panels, active in your PTAs or in the classroom, you know, I applaud what you're doing. I side with you taking a little different path on how to get things done. But it's, 
It is critical. There's, there's no point. I should never show this picture to a kid again. I should never show this picture to a kid again if the reality is we've lost as a country the ability to give those, that child the skills that would make it somewhat plausible that they could contribute to, if not this great cause, some other great cause that they might find lined up more with their passions. If we're just dangling stuff in front of them that we've let get out of their reach because we've lost the ability as a nation to really give them a solid grounding in, in a broad array of topics, including science and math, then you know, I should burn up all the slides. It's, it's unkind. Uh, we're done. Thank you. Thank you.